Hello, Happy New Year. I am the Grub Street Lodger and I'm not quite sure how well I'm going to be able to keep up with my deadlines uh, over the next few months because I am starting a new novel and my plan is to write the whole first draft by Easter Sunday, which um, I worked out would be a thousand words a day or thereabouts. Uh, at the moment, I'm 3,000 words late. It's only the 10th of January. But I can catch up tomorrow because I've got most of tomorrow off. So we'll, we'll be alright, maybe. Yes, here's my video. This video is about the books I read in December. I read more than I thought. Book one Loitering with Intent by Muriel Spark. I've had a bit of a journey with Muriel Spark over the last few years. I read The Prime Minister Jean Brodie, which I thought was great. This year I read The Bachelors, which I thought was nah, average. And I read Driving Seat, or Driver's Seat, sorry, which I thought was really, really, really good. This time I read this, and I thought it was not that brilliant. Um, plot is this woman here by the way this cover's awful it really doesn't sum up the book very well but this woman here uh, she has got a job uh, working with people who are creating autobiographies that are a bit too spicy for now they're going to be put in vaults for about 10-20 years in the future and then they'll revolutionise the world and she is a wannabe writer and she takes a lot of influences from these people and she puts them in her own book Though, actually, what she insists is that these people happen to reflect the people in her book anyway, and that she makes them a bit more similar. It's just because these people are already the spitting image of who is in her book. Um, at the same time, the person who runs the Society of Autobiography Writers um, starts changing the autobiographies to make them more like her book. And uh, To be honest, I, I didn't completely understand what was happening. Uh, I'd like to think of myself as a pretty decent reader, but on the whole, I, I didn't get this book. Uh, she was a bit, a bit sketchy, and I didn't completely trust her. And I think I was probably supposed to when she said, "Oh, uh, these people happen to reflect the people in my book." I think I was supposed to say, "I believe you," when I didn't really, uh, or maybe I was supposed to not believe her because a lot of these mural spark um protagonists that i've read are a little bit a little bit unusual and uh trick you uh in the end it was a book with some good moments but on the whole it was a uh, an enjoyable book for most of the runtime. at the end was a little bit weak and i'm probably not going to remember it very much so mural spark she hits she misses that was a bit of a miss My next book is Augustus Carp, Esquire, by himself, but not really. It's by this guy called Sir Henry Howarth Bashford, who was a doctor, uh, but he kept himself anonymous when the book came out. And the book is um, a fictional autobiography of this man called Augustus Carp, and he is a religious person. He thinks himself to be a very good, forthright kind of guy, um, very, very holy. Uh, actually, he's a horrible prig. He's a really deeply unpleasant person who uses his religion to get one over on people and to do better in life. And when someone gets his own back on him, we're cheering the person who's got his own back. Um, Augustus Carp's father is called Augustus Carp. And it's quite clear he's the same kind of person. His son is also called Augustus Carp. And it's clear... He's also going to be the same kind of person. We have these um, teetotal, holier than thou, righteous people who are quite happy to screw you over and kick you out of your job, uh, even if you have kids, because they're not good people, they just follow the rules. And they believe in those who follow the rules. And if they don't follow the rules... That's because they're better than you and they don't have to. And he's a horrible, horrible character. And the way it's written, he doesn't realise he's a horrible character at all. 
but you realize so quickly. And all the people he spends time with is hor are horrible. Uh, his father's horrible. Um, his friends are horrible. Everybody's horrible. And it is funny, but it's just a bit too much horrible for me. A little bit too much. Um, yeah, it's like... Puta actually was quite a nice guy behind it all. He was he was a bit of an insufferable prig, but he he wasn't a horrible person. He just had his priorities in the wrong place and, and he got confused. Augustus Cup is not a nice guy. Augustus Cup is horrible. And the essence is that they carry on forever. Um, it's funny, but it's so viciously funny that it's not pleasantly funny. It's It's kind of funny and horrible. And the next book is The Return of Martin Gur Gar Gur Gur Gar Apparently it's a film with Gerard Depardieu. I've not seen it. I just thought it was interesting from the back. Anyway, this this um person here, Natalie Zemon Davis she was the historical um, consultant on the film and after doing that she wrote this book and if you haven't seen the film which I've never heard of and if you haven't read the book Martin Gere he had uh, a wife uh, and a young son I believe it's been a while since I think it was a young son and he went off and he went and had adventures he actually had his uh, leg cut off uh, in the wars and then someone came back and said I am Martin Gurr and his wife accepted him and all his family accepted him and uh, they treated him as Martin Gurr but he didn't quite follow the cultural norms because they were from the Basque region they had their own ways of doing things uh, particularly in terms of who inherited what and Martin Gurr instead of inheriting was quite happy to sell off bits of his land which was very against um, the Basque way but all his family did accept him at first because he had private stories about all of them and then some of them would begin to think maybe this isn't Martin Gurr and he goes through a series of trials and we don't really find out how the trials end because it seems like the tr the, the, the big trial in the town is going to let him off but then the real Martin Gurr comes and everyone goes oh yeah that's the real guy actually who's this guy and um, he ends up getting burnt to death in the town square. Uh, we're not told a great deal about what happens to the woman. Uh, why she accepted Martin Gerd, the fake one. Uh, what she felt about the real one coming back. And that's all sort of suggested, fleshed out in here. So it's a, it's a good bit of history. It's very, very interesting about why a family would accept someone who they... They should know, you know. The guy had put on lots of weight, lost lots of interest, and forgotten half his family language. But maybe they're so desperate for this man coming back. Maybe because there's no portraits. Um, maybe just because he knows these secret things, they go, they just accept it. It's a, it reminded me a great deal of a book I read a few years ago about Salmanazer. Salmanazer, he came to England and claimed he was from Formosa which is uh, Taiwan, if I remember right. And what he did was he kept his story straight. So as ridiculous as he would be, and as much as he'd make up this stupid language, he kept it the same every time. And it was the consistency which had people believing. So you got this guy, white guy, um, you know, round face, pale skin, being accepted as Taiwanese because it was all about the language and he kept the language straight. And it reminded me of that. This guy kept his story straight and that kept him uh, in the clear for a long time until his family wanted some money off him. And in fact, to be honest, it was it was the uh, inter-family financial stuff that really caused him problems. Okay, my next book. Um, by the way, in the link below... Uh, I'm actually pointing out my knees, but there should be something under there. Uh, my sister calls it a doofer. I think a doofer is a more active mechanical object. But in there, uh, there 
is the link to my list challenges, which is all the books I read this year. 70 odd books. Uh, most of them pretty good. And the ones that weren't good were bad with something interesting about them. Except for the ones that are really bad. Um, and you'll see what they are. Um, and then there's also a link to two sort of volumes of my top 10 books of last year. Uh, books 10 to, to 6 and then 5 to 1. And the winner, sorry to give spoilers, was this. David Copperfield. I wasn't going to read another Dickens. I'd read Bleak House. That was going to be my Dickens for the year. It was big enough and uh, enjoyable enough and full enough for me. But I don't know. I just, I just got a real itch for David Copperfield. And I knew I had a copy on the shelves. It's actually Dickens' longest work. Very, very long. It's very unlike Bleak House, though, because Bleak House is full of subplots and extra characters and this and that and the other, whilst David Copperfield is, in fact, quite streamlined. It's it's one guy's story, and yes, it's his life and his story, and it, you, go, you meet different people and he goes through different periods in his life, but essentially it's about him and about the strength that he grows in order to survive his life, and then the other characters are... Uh, they affect him, but they're also reflections of him. So some of the characters don't have the strength of of uh, their upbringing. People like Steerforth, um, who doesn't have a firm figure the way he has Aunt Betsy. And so Steerforth goes off and makes certain mistakes that David Copperfield will not. Or um, other people like Mr. Micawber, who who falls into debt when he gets married and can never get himself out of it until the end. And so David Copperfield works very hard not to get into debt when he marries and so on and so forth. One of the things that I enjoyed about reading this book, which has nothing to do with the book, is that I was given this book almost exactly 20 years ago, because 20 years ago there was this BBC adaptation. And this is the, the proper Penguin edition with uh, all the notes and the chapter hit, um like the notes that Dickens made before each chapter and things like that. But it's in this cover, which has a very, a very young Daniel Radcliffe, pre-Harry Potter Daniel Radcliffe in there, and Bob Hoskins uh, as Miss Micawber. And then uh, you've got uh, Rodney the Plonker as Uriah Heep. And I, <laughs> I grew to really enjoy this copy just because it was the proper copy but looked quite naff but I, I got it almost exactly 20 years at Christmas and I finished it Christmas Eve so that that kind of felt good and it was my favorite book this year I'm not a huge fan of long books on the whole I prefer a shorter book uh, even with a long book I'm enjoying I get this feeling of oh, I'd like to be reading something else now and it wasn't until the last 30 or so pages of this book that I got that feeling for most of it I could have been happy there Completely. I love the characters. I love Peggotty and Mr. Peggotty and Ham. I love Betsy Trotwood. I love hating Uriah Heep and Murdstone. And, and I had a really good time. And honestly, I think it's... Well, I haven't read all of Dickens. I've read about six or seven now. I, I definitely want to read more. It's my favourite Dickens so far. And it was my favourite book of the year. Uh, you could just get lost in it. If it was perfect for for the winter, because you just dived in and were there, and it was a really nice place to be. But I finished it Christmas Eve, um, which means that Christmas Day I could read a book that I was given then. Does it fart? It's. Well, it's a book about whether animals fart. Every animal you get, every animal, every page you get a, a picture of an animal farting. There's a rhino, or indeed not farting. And then you get rhinoceros, scientific family name, uh, Rhinosoturidea. Does it fart? Yes. And then you get some facts about whether it farts, and also some facts about rhinos in general. Uh, the rhino one ends on a sad part. Sadly, there are fewer Rhino farts in the world today than there were historically, as large numbers of all five species have been killed for their horns. I learned a surprising amount through this book. Uh, I learned that birds do not fart. I learned that most mammals do. Bats might, but they make lots of squeaky noises, so it's hard to tell. 
and sloths don't because their digestion is so slow they don't actually build up gas. Uh, the worst kind of farters are your ruminids, the ones with like four stomachs, or ones like camels, which are front that they, they kind of deal mostly with their front stomach. They have two or three, uh, and they're the worst farters. Um, insects are weird. Uh, we knew this. I know a human being farts on average uh, ten to twenty times a day, though it can be up to fifty. I've not counted a day's worth of farting for me. Might be worth a go. Next book I read, I don't have a copy of because I borrowed it and it was called, I'm looking at this note I've got here, The Luck of the Devil. And it was a play and it was by someone who lived on my dad's road who lent it to my dad and then I read it. And it was first performed in the Garrett Club. So I might have met him because I've met a whole bunch of people from the Garrett Club. I've met the president and uh, quite a few members because they turn up Samuel Johnson things that I go to. And uh, the lead actor who played the devil in The Luck of the Devil was Ian Kelly who came to the Samuel Johnson book group to talk about his book. Uh, Samuel Samuel Foot's other leg, Mister Foot Mister Foot's other leg, uh, which is a really good book about Samuel Foot, uh, and he also turned that into a play. And this is uh, quite a short play. It took me about twenty minutes to read. It's three acts, and it's set in I want to say Prague. It's not Prague, Vienna, um, in nineteen twenty nine when all the banks are collapsing. A banker desperately needs something to to keep his bank going the devil comes up and offers him something uh, for his soul and he says yes however earlier that day he kissed a priest and that means his soul is safe so now the devil's got to give him stuff for his soul without receiving his soul and devils are like well you might as well give me a hand because i've got a few problems because this priest that you were talking to he's trying to say i don't exist and that i'm just a metaphor so if you convince him I do exist, we're square, all right? And and that's what he does, and that's the play. And it was good fun. Uh, you can tell that the guy who wrote it is is a raconteur of the old school. He drinks good wine. Uh, he knows a good cigar, probably. Um, I don't know a good cigar. I quite like the smell of cigars. I don't know how you find one's good, though. I guess it's fat. I don't know. Anyway, you tell this is a, a decent kind of person. Um, to be with and he's fun to be with through the medium of this play that was it really the next book I read was called The Long Over Easy and it's by Jasper Ford or F Ford he's got two F's there's another author with the Ford surname as well uh, I read some of the Thursday Next books a few years ago when I was sleeping on someone's floor and she had a load of them and I read a couple, I think. They all blurred into one. They were very funny but not not very lingering. Uh, this would probably be in the same category, though it's not a Thursday Next Book. Uh, it's about the nursery crime division who are policemen who deal with all the sorts of crimes that happen in nursery rhymes. And if you think of your nursery rhymes, some of these are quite vicious. Or your your fairy tales. You know, you've got uh, witches trying to eat people and being bored alive. And you've got uh, woodcutters being murdered in weird ways. And you've got all kinds of strange things going on. Um, there's Giorgio Porgio, who's like the mafia boss. who uh, He's a bit of a ladies' man. Uh, what else they got in it? Oh yeah, there's a turning straw into gold racket run by a guy called Rumple Stiltskin. Anyway, in this one, Humpty Dumpty is cracked on the floor. Was he pushed? Was he shot? Did he jump himself? Spoilers, he hatched and grew a big Humpty monster that stomped over the last act, which, to be honest, I thought was a bit crap. But up to that point, we had a lot of very funny jokes about nursery rhymes and police procedurals and detective novels. There's a, a guild of detectives and they start passing laws to ensure that, well, first that murders act like detective novels. But then as those things become cliche, it's that they don't do that. So there's a no twins ban and things like that. 
and it was very funny and it was exactly the kind of thing I wanted um, for that little period between Christmas and New Year and I did enjoy it very much but I know it's not going to last. Finally, the last book I read. Uh, this was in my pocket uh, New Year's Eve but I finished it on the train on the way to where I was going for a night out. So, just before New Year. Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. I don't know what I was expecting. I mean, I've seen the film lots of times. I, I think I was expecting a through line the way the film does. You know, the film has a very obvious story that the dad is, is ignoring the children and he has to learn to love the children and the children have to learn to let go of certain things and stuff like that. Yeah, it's not in the book. In the book, Mary Poppins turns up. Uh, she's a bit odd. She goes on some weird adventures with the children. She goes on some without. You know the whole, it's a jolly holiday with Mary. It's based on the chapter in which Mary Poppins goes out for a day off, meets up with Bert, who's only in that chapter. They jump into a painting and have a nice cup of tea. Okay, I mean, fine. You know, the tea party up, up on the ceilings there. Um, Topsy Turvy is mentioned, if I remember right. Who's in, who's in the Disney sequel. It's just adventures and some of them are really disturbing there's there's one where the, the the there are four children there two babies and and two older children and the two older children go to the zoo in the middle of the night uh, to celebrate the birthday and all the animals are at the zoo and humans are in the zoo including some humans they know and the humans are sort of ridiculed and then the animals will do a conga line and it turns out it's for Mary Poppins because it's her birthday and the king of the snakes strips off and gives her his skin and says that she's the great exception uh, whatever that is it's all a little bit it's a bit it's a bit off putting really um, and then chapter before that the two little babies um, they're in their cots and they're babbling away and they're speaking in baby speak and they can talk to the sunshine and the wind. And Starling comes and has a chat with them and takes a piss because he's like, well, you know, when you get older, when you get to about one years old, you're going to forget all of this. And the babies start crying and they're really upset. Well, we don't want to forget all this. We're connected to the world in such a way. We don't want to lose all this. And then the Starling goes away for a bit and he comes back a couple of months later and he tries to have a chat with them and uh, they've forgotten it all. The way we all do. Uh, they don't have that connection with the world anymore. That's really disturbing. The only person who does is Mary, because she is the great exception. Um, I've got the rest of the Mary Poppins books on Kindle, and if I don't, I know someone who does. So I might go for them. It was uh, a peculiar way to end the new year. But to be honest, I started the, the next year with a story about a man who lives in a zoo, so it, it all seemed to run on pretty well, really. So yeah, there were my December books. There was a few more than I expected, really, especially considering I was reading uh, David Copperfield, was a great big chunk of a book. So next year, I am writing a book. Uh, as I said, I want to get it ready by Easter Sunday, and so if I miss some of these, that'll be why. I just don't have time. I'm doing it now. In the dark. Um, quite a long time after work. I'll probably upload it on Sunday though, because I'm not sure when I'll get a chance. But yes, that's the end of my 2019 stuff. Though it is 2020 now. I hope you're having a great 2020. I'll see you next month. I don't know what I'm doing here. Finger guns. Pew. <laughs> great. <laughs>